Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Ghislaine Maxwell case. Maxwell is a former associate of Jeffrey Epstein, and she has been charged with a number of federal crimes. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll be looking at the background and timeline together, and then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. Before I get started with the background, it is important to note that in this case, Ghislaine Maxwell has the presumption of innocence, and she has denied any wrongdoing. So moving now to the background and timeline, Ghislaine Maxwell was born on December 25, 1961, in France. Her father, Robert Maxwell, owned several newspapers. She went to Oxford University, earning a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and she became a socialite in London. Maxwell and her siblings grew up wealthy. A few of them, including Maxwell, worked for her father. He bought the New York Daily News in January 1991. In November of that same year, he would die of an accidental drowning near the Canary Islands. Maxwell believed her father was murdered. Maxwell moved to New York City and became a socialite there as she worked for a Madison Avenue real estate company. Not long after Robert Maxwell's death, an investigation revealed that Maxwell had stolen the equivalent of $770 million in pension funds. Two of Ghislaine Maxwell's brothers were arrested. They were charged with fraud. They had worked for their father, like Ghislaine did. They were acquitted in January of 1996. Maxwell started this effort to protect the oceans, called the Terra Mar Project. She conducted lectures on this topic, where she identified herself as the president of a global consultancy company. She also said that she was a licensed helicopter pilot, she knew how to pilot submarines, and she was a certified EMT. That project ceased activity in 2019 after Epstein was charged. Maxwell met Jeffrey Epstein sometime in the early 90s. It's not exactly clear when it was, but they were photographed together in 1992. Their relationship would persist until Epstein was sent to jail in 2008. It's not clear if they had any dealings past that point. One of the mysteries that I suppose may become less mysterious after the federal government presents its case against Maxwell is what was Maxwell to Epstein? What was the relationship like? She appears to have fulfilled a number of roles as part of Epstein's inner circle. They were close friends. They had some type of romantic relationship. She was one of his girlfriends. In 2003, Epstein referred to her as his best friend. Maxwell had other romantic relationships while she was with Epstein, so it was not an exclusive relationship. And of course, we know Epstein had other relationships as well. Maxwell was an assistant to Epstein, helping to organize his life. She would manage his schedule. In a lawsuit that she filed against Epstein's estate in 2020, she said that she was an employee of Epstein's for several years and had managed his properties. Essentially, Maxwell really seemed to be around a lot, helping Epstein with various tasks. Epstein and Maxwell also shared positions as defendants in a number of civil lawsuits related to Epstein's sexual assaults. During those proceedings, she was accused of many different criminal acts, although, of course, it was in the context of a civil suit. It was alleged that she recruited underaged females for Epstein. She allegedly threatened underage females with physical harm if they did not do as she ordered and as Epstein instructed. And she allegedly participated directly in the assaults. Maxwell is friends with Prince Andrew, who, as I talked about in another video, gave a disastrous interview to the BBC about his relationship with Epstein, and he talked about the accusations of one of Epstein's victims, Virginia Roberts Gouffre, who accused Prince Andrew of assaulting her on three separate occasions when she was 17 years old. Maxwell also appears to have some degree of connection to a number of other famous people, including Harvey Weinstein, Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, and Kevin Spacey. On July 2, 2020, the FBI arrested 58-year-old Maxwell at her home in New Hampshire. She was charged with six federal crimes. There were two counts of perjury. We see a charge for enticing a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts, 
and a conspiracy charge for the same thing. And then we see transporting a minor with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity. And again, conspiracy for that same charge. If convicted, she could be sentenced to 35 years in federal prison. Now, I read the indictment in this case. It appears the prosecution is really focusing on 1994 through 1997. The indictment said that Maxwell recruited, groomed, and abused victims who were under the age of 18. It also said she used several tactics, including showing an interest in the victims, befriending them, taking them shopping, paying for travel, and their education. Another allegation in that indictment says that Maxwell normalized Epstein's criminal behavior. She would talk about sexual topics, she would undress in front of the victims, and be present during the abuse. At the time I'm making this video, Maxwell is represented by an attorney named Christian Everdell, whose claim to fame is that he worked on a team that investigated and arrested a drug cartel leader named Guzman, otherwise known as El Chapo. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors, the difficulty with Maxwell is we really don't know a lot about her. She was good at being a socialite, but at the same time, she was good about not giving away personal information. If someone like Maxwell was guilty, what would that person be like? I'm not talking specifically about Maxwell, but in general, here's the profile we see in the research literature for women who sexually abuse minors. To start with, women rarely commit these offenses. Less than 5% of all sex offenders are female. When they do offend, often they are in the third decade of life, so between 20 and 30 years old. They are typically poorly educated and have low socioeconomic status, when women do offend, they rarely get reported, arrested, or prosecuted. There are several common mental disorders among female perpetrators that we see. Some include psychosis, like schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, and bipolar disorder. Others are personality disorders, like dependent, histrionic, borderline, and antisocial personality disorders. We see substance use disorder is overrepresented, as is post-traumatic stress disorder. 48% of these offenders have significant mental health problems. Now, in terms of working with conspirators, over 70% of the time, we see that female perpetrators act in a conspiracy with a male perpetrator. In these instances, and when female perpetrators act alone, they tend to be less coercive than males, and they rarely physically injure victims. When conspiring with a male, this type of offender falls into one of two categories, male coerced, or the willing ally imposter category. 85% of the time, female perpetrators have just one victim who is related to them. Female offenders tend to have a history of maltreatment when they're young, and they make bad choices in mates. So they pick men who commit sexual assault, for example. Female offenders also tend to take responsibility when they are arrested. Now, looking at the personality profile of a typical female offender, I will use the five-factor model. I remember the big five traits through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. So the profile would have an unspecified level of openness to experience. This doesn't seem to be really tied to offending or not offending. We would see low conscientiousness, low extroversion, mid to low agreeableness, and high neuroticism, which makes a lot of sense if we think about personality disorders like histrionic, dependent, and borderline. So with all these characteristics in mind, how does someone in a situation like Maxwell compare? Well, we see a number of dissimilarities. Maxwell is older than someone in their third decade. She's well-educated, she's wealthy, and I'm not aware of any mental disorder ever having been reported. She allegedly had multiple victims. Three were named in the indictment. Of course, there could be more. In terms of similarities, it's alleged that she offended in the presence of a male. Jeffrey Epstein, and made a bad choice in mates. It's hard to imagine making a worse choice than Epstein. Looking at the five-factor model profile for somebody like Maxwell, we see high openness to experience, a mid-level of conscientiousness, extroversion and agreeableness, and low neuroticism. So to have this type of crime committed by somebody like Maxwell is very unusual. So why would somebody in a situation like Maxwell's commit crimes like this? Outside of everything I covered with offender characteristics, here are a few additional thoughts. Sometimes when people get extremely wealthy and powerful, when they can have anything that they want, they take anything that they want. 
they are not satisfied leaving any desire unmet. No matter if that desire is immoral, harmful, illegal, it really makes little difference to them. Wealth and power corrupt people. People chase material excess, but after a while, they realize that they want more. They want to delve into the realm of darker desires. It's a lot like drug use. Somebody takes a drug, but they need more and more to get the same high from it. It's never enough. We also see a sense of entitlement and arrogance could play a part in something like this. The last question here is, will Maxwell be convicted? This is really an interesting case. It's the FBI versus someone who's extremely wealthy and well-connected. Both categories have a pretty good track record in terms of winning these types of cases. So it's a little bit like an irresistible force and an immovable object. We see that Maxwell has immunity because of the 2008 plea agreement that Epstein made. The government is going to argue that the agreement only covers Florida, but it actually says the United States. So this could be a really short prosecution. If that non-prosecution agreement is upheld, then all these charges are gone. Now, they also looked again, as I mentioned, at 1994 through 1997. That makes this an old case. A lot can go wrong when the alleged crime was so long ago. What evidence is new in this case? Is it 100% based on the testimony of the three victims listed in the indictment? So there's just a lot we don't know around the strength of the evidence. Maybe the government hopes that Maxwell will testify against other people, like Prince Andrew, in exchange for immunity. So this may be more of an annoyance for Maxwell that she wants to get rid of by testifying. So even if the evidence isn't really that strong, they may be able to convince her to do that. But looking at her history, she, again, is really good at not talking. So I would be surprised if she were guilty that she would cooperate at all. With the personality we may be looking at in a situation like this, I see this going to trial. So those are my thoughts on the Ghislaine Maxwell case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.